The adaptation of flight is one of the most fascinating stories in evolution because it encapsulates why we find it so interesting. The idea that selective pressures would force an animal into having no option but to fly. The first animals to conquer flight were insects, and they were unrivaled in this ability for almost 100 million years. But during the Triassic, the first ever vertebrates evolved to take to the skies, the pterosaurs. As most of you will know, pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, but they are thought to be very closely related. They are archosaurs, which is a group of reptiles containing dinosaurs and crocodiles, and diverged from the dinosaur lineage fairly shortly before they became true dinosaurs. Unfortunately, even the earliest pterosaurs discovered have extreme specializations for flight, so the transition from reptiles to pterosaurs is not obvious in the fossil record. This makes it impossible to know exactly how they evolved to form wings and their other features, or what this transition would have looked like. Having said this, there does seem to be a vague consensus that the closest known relative to pterosaurs was a strange looking reptile called Scleromoclus. And although some reconstructions show some fairly pterosaurian features, they are obviously not avian. Despite not having any transitional fossils, there are inferences that can be made. Mark Witten, who made a lot of the artwork used in this video, created a likely five-stage hypothesis for the transition from a close relation of Scleromoclus into a primitive pterosaur. He called it the hypothetical pterosaur ancestors. It would start with a close ancestor of Scleromoclus that was perhaps slightly better suited for life in the trees. Then it would become more suited for life in the trees, evolving more flexible limbs and its fifth digit would become vestigial, as later pterosaurs do not have this. Then it would evolve short wing membranes between the slightly elongated little finger and its hind legs. This perhaps evolved because they were less likely to die from a fall from the branches with very small membranes, but then they became more derived and could use them to glide to avoid predators. This gliding creature's membranes would increase to the point where they would need to be folded back when they were not using them, and this creature could fly, although very poorly. And finally, the fifth stage shows the common ancestor of all pterosaurs. Scleromoclus was tiny, about 18 centimeters long, and contained very small bones, so if the common ancestor of pterosaurs was a similar size, it would be difficult for its body to fossilize and may never be found. However, this model offers a pretty good description of a likely transition to flight for pterosaurs. Although the process would be quite different, Draco lizards are able to glide down from the top of trees to other trees in the area, so it's not far-fetched for a reptile not too dissimilar to this started pterosaurs in their pathway to powered flight. One of the earliest pterosaurs ever discovered was called Preondactylus that dated back to the mid-Triassic over 220 million years ago. Its wings, like all pterosaurs, are fairly anatomically similar to the wings of a bat, but the wing membrane was entirely balanced on their massively extended little finger, whereas bats have theirs spread across several digits. This led to the distinctive little pterosaur hand to be free from the wing. This pterosaur and many others are often grouped together under the name Ramphorhynchoidea. That is an informal group that includes the first pterosaurs to evolve and categorizes them via certain primitive features that later pterosaurs would lose. These would include very small and squat wings even for their small bodies, relatively long legs, and a distinctive long tail. Another fellow and more famous Ramphorhynchoid was Dimorphodon that lived in the early Jurassic and exemplifies these traits as well. Dimorphodon were thought to be clumsy flyers, the pterosaurs were adapting to be masters of the skies. One small and strange looking Jurassic pterosaur called a Neurogonathid would show the signs of things to come. The Neurogonathids were likely insectivores and were thought to be nocturnal due to their large eyes. They perhaps lived in a very similar way to bats and even bared resemblance. They had very flexible joints in their wings, meaning they sacrificed speed for maneuverability, which is synonymous with insectivorous flying creatures. However, their most important adaptation was the loss of their large Ramphorhynchoidean tail, as they are closely related to the common ancestor of a new, more derived group of pterosaurs called pterodactyloids. The most basal member of this group currently known is called Cryptodracon, that lived in the mid-Jurassic. Both of its wings were far more slender and longer than with previous pterosaurs. It had a short tail, and its metacarpal, or hand bones, were elongated making the wing more aerodynamic, all features that define pterodactyloids. The new adaptations these pterosaurs had were very successful, and they would most likely be able to fly higher, faster, and for longer. Another feature that pterodactyloids would pioneer are beaks, as early pterosaurs had a row of small needle-like teeth that would carry on into later species of pterosaur. However, the most derived pterosaurs wore beaks just like birds, and similar to birds, lost their teeth altogether, as no pterosaurs in the late Cretaceous have been found with teeth. This seems to be a process that flying vertebrates go through, as beaks are considerably lighter than teeth, and are just as good at doing a variety of jobs. 
One of the most famous beak pterosaurs and one of the most famous prehistoric creatures in general was Pteranodon that was very large with a 6 meter long wingspan. It would have stalked the inland ocean that used to exist in North America as it is very well known that it regularly fed on fish. The fossil records of pterosaurs reveal a very rich ecological history with the oceans and lakes and one very peculiar animal called Pteridaustro had a thousand bristle-like modified teeth that were used to filter feeding similar to modern day flamingos. There is also evidence that prehistoric sharks fed on pterosaurs, as there is a pterosaur wing with bite marks on it likely belonging to a shark. It is also very well known that pterosaurs were eaten by theropod dinosaurs. Most compelling was a pterosaur that was found with a spinosaur tooth embedded in its spine. Their synonymy with the ocean is quite fitting, as when the first pterosaur fossils were found, it was proposed that they were ocean-going animals. This conclusion was reached to explain what their unusually long front limbs were used for, assuming that they may have propelled themselves through the water with them, but later it was realised that they were wings. Pterodactyloids also reached massive sizes during the Cretaceous. Already mentioned, pteranodons were very large, but wind spans of up to 6 metres weren't rare. The most monstrous of all the pterosaurs was Quetzalcoatlus, with a 10 meter long windspan rivaling a small aircraft, and it was also tall enough to look a giraffe in the eye. But how did these animals fly, and why haven't birds got this big? These pterosaurs had hollow bones, and in large pterosaurs the outer wall of the bone was very thin, meaning these animals would have been very light for their body size. This doesn't answer the question of why birds haven't reached pterosaur sizes, as they too possess this feature, but large pterosaurs like Quetzalcoatlus are thought to have been no heavier than 250 kilos. And although this may be reaching the limits of as large as flying animals can possibly reach, they almost certainly did fly. These large pterosaurs weren't quickly transitioning between flight and land like small birds, but only flew when they needed to, and when they got in the air they were flying for long distances. It is thought that they were terrestrial predators, hunting or scavenging on the ground, and only took to the air to travel to another feeding ground, but didn't hunt in the air. They probably lived similar to how storks live today. The answer to why birds haven't reached the same size as the large pterosaurs has a few theories, but most satisfying is called the quad launch hypothesis, which looks into the way in which pterosaurs take off for flight, as they use all their limbs but birds only have two legs to take off from. The way that pterosaurs take off is to kick off with their hind limbs with their front limbs firmly on the ground, catapulting their body forward. Once their body is airborne, they release their wings and start to fly. This method of takeoff would have been far more efficient than the two limb takeoff that birds are stuck with and Quetzalcoatlus could have been three to five times heavier than the largest flying birds that ever lived. Pterosaurs completely died out along with the non-avian dinosaurs 65 million years ago. However, if they didn't, birds wouldn't have diversified as much and go on to fill nearly all their niches from insect eaters to fish eaters. Some of them even reaching massive sizes like Pelagornis or Argentavis, but nothing flying would ever reach these sizes again. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to be notified of future content from me, then consider subscribing.